Greetings, this is Bradford Donald Keller Townsend, and this is part three of uh, Charles Hall and Company uh, research paper on the decline of energy return on energy investments and the critical, I cannot emphasize it enough, uh, energy policy of our global mechanical civilization. And I prefer mechanical over industrial, just to emphasize the importance of trains, uh, ships, tractors, uh, diesel-powered construction equipment. As most people don't in their daily lives, uh, uh, you know, operate construction equipment and such, and they 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 forget the importance, uh, you know, of a diesel 18-wheeler uh, tractor trailer truck, you know, has in our lives. 4.3 coal, the only EROI analyses for coal production are the U.S. and China because information on the energy extended to extract coal in other areas of the world appears unavailable. Time series of EROI for coal production of the United States and China are given in figure 11. A great deal of variability in EROI is evident in these figures. This data, however, have significant holes, e.g., no data is reported for approximately 30 years from the mid-1950s to the mid-1980s. Cleveland's work provides additional information for three non-contiguous years that is only partly consistent with Below et al.'s findings, Hugh et al. 2013 estimates, annual data for Chinese coal production for the years 1994 through 2009. These show very little variation in EROI values. 5. Research challenges. There are four major challenges for calculating the EROI of various fuels at the national, regional, and global scales. First is the lack of data on fuel used during the extraction process. Data on opposite non-traded fuels generally is not readily available. I'm sorry, that was on-site non-traded fuels. Although ideally they are reported to government agencies undertaking census work. Often, direct energy cost calculations must be derived from financial data. This requires converting currency into an energy equivalent, e.g. megajoules, used per dollar of GDP, gross domestic product. Methods for accomplishing this conversion usually assume that expenditure for inputs in the energy industry are the same for society more generally, or for an engineering component. They may be less accurate, but sensitively analyzes can be undertaken to address uncertainties. Ideally, input-output analysis is undertaken, which can give much more accurate results. This analysis used to be done by a team at the University of Illinois, but these results are seriously outdated. A more recent analysis may have been done at Carnegie Mellon's Green Building Program, from which useful general values can be obtained. Pareto and Hall, 2012, Chapter 4. Second is the issue of variation in scale. Are studies at the regional level comparable to those at the national level, and how do these size up in parentheses, when presented next to international studies that include a small subset of representative countries. Various variables and boundaries often vary with the scale of investigation, making it difficult to compare data among diverse analyses. Third, energy analysts are not in agreement on what direct costs should and should not be included in an EROI assessment. When complete systems are analyzed for solar photovoltaic installations, their financing, their operations and maintenance costs, and their backups are included. The energy costs are about three times larger 
than for just the modes and inverters. So that's big. <laughs> Three times. One very contentious indirect cost is the inclusion or exclusion of the energy cost of supporting human labor. Murphy et al. 2011. This can result in varying potentially controversial assessments, especially when assessing fuels where small differences may determine whether that fuel is perceived as a viable energy option, e.g. corn-based ethanol. Fourth, is that the quality or utility of these various fuels is represented differentially within different data sets. Total primary energy cons consumption values at the global level published by the United States Energy Information Agency International Energy Agency, those are a little bit confusing. That's the one in Paris, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, and the U.S. Energy Information Agency is EIA. And I'm dyslexic. I make dyslexic learner videos. But they're different. Uh, one's an American out of Washington, D.C., and one's uh, out of Paris, France, and it has different funding. And BP, that's usually British Petroleum, tend to be similar. They occasionally vary, however, in their method of addressing primary energy conversion. For example, the EIA, that's the American uh, Bureau uh, Administration, data includes the heat generated by nuclear power in its energy output assessments. Various researchers, government agencies, and industry organizations present data from a variety of sources using various assessments, e.g. national, that's the EIA, and global, that's the Paris-based IEA, and industrial, that's a large um, private, well, I guess it's a public company, but it's not a... Um, it, somewhat independent of the British government, but the British government is kind of a hybrid government, uh, public, free enterprise-based company. Lahara Ira, Lahara Ira addressed this issue at the 2011 OSPO conference. Lahira 2011, he also noted that the IEA data is presented as the direct electricity generated from nuclear and hydropower. That's a big deal for France as they have, um, I think, at least 70% of their electricity from nuclear. They're the most nuclearized country for electricity in, on the planet. While the EIA, that's the Americans' data, includes waste heat produced by nuclear fission. There is a broadly consistent pattern in our results as indicated by similar temporal, that means time patterns, of different studies, all of which, except coal, have declined over time and with increased effort. And by the fact that regions developed for oil and gas for a longer period, e.g. U.S., China, or anywhere over time, have lower EROIs while newer developments, e.g. Norway, tend to have higher values. If and as the Murphy et al. 2011 protocol is more universally followed, we expect even greater consistency in results. Section 6, the discussion. This should be good meaty section for anybody who's hung in with me so far. And remember, this is life and death to you. You know, whether it's John or Jane or Mary or Curtis out there, it doesn't matter. Um, it's this, these issues or, or the you know, forces are going to affect every human being on the planet, rich, poor, you know, sheltered in academia and the ivy, ivory towers or a, a laborer digging um, foundations. Our research summarizes EROI estimates for all industrial fuels and for three major fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, over time. These initial estimates of general trends in EROI provide us with a beginning on which we and others can build as additional and better data become available. 
6.1, Historical Perspective. It covers the epoch 1900-1939. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing by the early 1900s. Abundant, high-quality coal was rel with relatively thick seams with high energy return on investment capable of generating an enormous amount of energy was harnessed by humans to do all kinds of economic work including heating, manufacturing, the generation of electricity and transportation, biomass energy in the form of wood burning for domestic use, heating and cooling, remained an important contributor to the world's energy portfolio. Perlin, 1989. During this period, the oil industry was in its infancy and was primarily used for transportation and lighting in the form of kerosene in a non-urban forward slash non-industrial regions. High quality oil remained a small contributor to the energy mix until the end of the 1930s. Although it was increasingly Increasing rapidly on a global scale. Hall and Klitgard. My family uh, was in the coal business in the 1800s and early part of the 20th century and uh, helped pay for uh, the universities in, here in Indiana with uh, the big profits they made. I can drive around the city and see some of our older buildings where we stole, st store, used to store coal. <laughs> um, 6.2 Historical Perspective 1940 to 1979 The massive World War II effort during the 1940s saw increased use of coal and oil for the manufacture and use of war machinery. During the post-war era, the great oil discoveries of the early 20th century found a use in global reconstruction and industrialization. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the repair of war-torn Europe and the proliferation of Western culture resulted in massive increases in the manufacturing and transport of goods and the oil necessary for the production and use. By the late 1960s, the EROI of coal mostly from deep mines began to decline while the EROI of oil remained high. The EROI of coal production in the U.S. declined from 80 to 1 in the 1950s all the way down to 30 to 1 in the 1970s. Cleveland et al. 1984. During this period, Coal was mined almost exclusively in the Appalachian Mountain region areas of the U.S. using a combination of room and pillar mines with conventional and continuous mining methods. The coal initially extracted from these locations was a combination of anthracite, that's the highest quality coal, it can be as much as 95% carbon atoms, <coughs> excuse me, and high quality bitumous coal that's usually in the 80 percent and it has a, you know the other part can be nasty like sulfur coal with high BTUs per ton that's British thermal units per ton or slash ton as the best coal was used first so the anthracite that they go for the lowest hanging easiest to get most profitable energy dense energy first and then you go down to lower grades of coal. Bitumous coal is what's used now where I live that's allowing me to make this recording now. As the best coal was used first, the EROI for coal decreased over time. The quality of coal being produced was decreasing while world oil production was increasing. The peak of U.S. oil production in 1970 and subsequent peak of U.S. conventional natural gas in 1973 meant an increased reliance on OPEC. That's a cartel uh, led by Saudi Arabia, and it has Kuwait and I think Indonesia and uh, Venezuela in it. 
there's, I think, 16 or something countries. Increases, you can Google that yourself and research it. <laughs> Increases in oil prices reflected in part increased energy required to purchase this fuel. The price of other economic activities increased at similar rates, Hall and Klitgard, 2012. After the oil shocks of the 1970s, and that was a huge event for those of us that were alive in the 70s, oil prices surged in the U.S. and around the world, stimulating both increased drilling activity and greater interest in the exploration of more marginal resources, those with higher production costs. Guilford et al., 2011. Increased drilling activity in the U.S. did not result in increased production, but caused a sharp decline in the EROI for conventional oil and gas for the United States between the early 1970s and mid-1980s. The oil shocks of the 1970s temporarily halted a long period of increased oil use. It also generated a global oil market and price, destroying an advantage once housed by the United States. Recovery of production did not occur in the continental United States where oil production had declined since its peak in 1970 until the rather recent uptick in 2008 following the introduction of new technologies of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. I have made, uh, I think, two or three videos explaining um, that. Um, new work on EROI of oil and gas produced by horizontal fracturing. New work on EROI for oil and gas produced by horizontal drilling and rock fracturing indicate that EROI can be very high, in part because it's not necessarily not necessary to pressurize the fields, e.g. Alcott and Malilo, 2013. Moeller and Murphy, personal communication. Wagner, personal communication. But that these high values are likely to decline substantially as production is moved off the sweet spots. So, like they said earlier in this paper, initially, um, you know, you get an EROI, the people gain lots of experience, and they uh, make improvements in their technique and their technology, and ERI goes up, and then they hit um, the peak of production, and then the technology no longer, you know, can... I mean, if there's the oil's gone, it's gone. So then the EROI goes down as they're trying to get the last of the uh, oil out. 6.3 historical perspective. We're getting closer to today. 1980-2009. In the 1980s, post-energy price shock era, oil that had been found but not developed suddenly became worthy of developing. Many world oil resources incentivized by higher prices were developed. Some were overdeveloped. Important gains in oil and gas production occurred in some non-OPEC countries, including Norway, Mexico, and China. Heating and transportation, historically fueled by coal, was transformed to oil and gas. That's significant. The other switching uh, fuels. Energy from coal production shifted too and remained essential to manufacturing and increasingly the production of electricity. Some things such as cement uh, require um, high amounts of energy for you know smelting and I don't know all the details but um, I know there are certain industries that require I think uh, aluminum and um, Certain chemicals require very hot, like furnace-type heat, and natural gas or coal is the best way to do it. And things like solar and wind uh, can't do it uh, efficiently and are impractical for it. The EROI of U.S. coal returned to 80 to 1 by 1990. This pattern reflects a shift to equal in the quality of coal extracted, the technology employed in the extraction process and 
especially the shift from underground to surface mining. That's huge. Um, surface mining is devastating, and uh, they're still doing surface mining in Appalachia, and it's just devastating to the wildlife, and it's dangerous for the uh, humans that live there as it leads to flash flooding, and they leave toxic giant ponds of uh, chemicals that can be released, you know, from dikes and pour down on the people and ruin, if it doesn't get them and they get away in time, it still can ruin their gardens and their properties and things. And in human lifespan type times, they'll never, you know, it's just ruined. And schools have been, you know, deluged with waves of toxic wastewater in Appalachia. Uh, one of the Kennedys is real big on uh, Klan people. It is I think it's Robert Jr. or the third is big on that one. Uh, a shift in mining location from Appalachia to the central and northern interior states of Montana and Wyoming, an extraction method from underground to surface mining area, contour, auger, and mountaintop mining techniques have resulted in less energy required to mine and beneficate coal. That means it helps coal may be more competitive in the, you know as if you're comparing alternatives. The energy content of coal extracted however has decreased. The coal currently mined is of lower quality bitumous coal and even sub-bitumous coal which has lower carbon content and lower energy density. And energy density is key when you're dealing with energy. You want the densest energy you can, especially if it has to be transported. With much lower BTUs per ton, Hall et al., 1986, Hall and Clickguard, 2012. The increased efficiency of surface mining seems to just about compensate for the decline in the quality of coal mined. See Section 7 for consideration of environmental externalities. Externalities is, um, let's say, the sulfur from burning um, or the ozone, uh, the nitrous oxide, um, what negative impacts that has on the environment. Um, the particulates, there might be uh, aluminum or uh, other metals that are burned and particulated and uh, in very small, uh, microscopic, you can't see it with your eye, but you breathe it and it's bad for your health. That's an externality or that school that got swamped in Appalachia. That's an externality that they usually don't count a dike breaking and wiping out a small town in Appalachia. Even if they warn the people to get out alive, that doesn't go into the EROI, into the uh, denominator costs, but it does cost society. Between 1985 and the early 1990s, international oil and gas prices fell, then remained stable until 2000 while drilling effort declined until the mid-2000s. Thus, the 1990s was a period of abundant oil and plummeting oil prices bringing the real cost of oil back to that of the early 1970s. Hall and Klitgard, 2012. That was an era uh, of prosperity when Clinton was president and he benefited from like this kind, kind of factor or force driving event that was not in his control, but he benefited from... Um, abundant energy and low energy prices which help the economy thrive. Discretionary spending in the U.S. and other Western nation often on housing increased. The late 1990s was a time of reduced oil exploration efforts apparently resulting in an increase in EROI. The mid-2000s marked an increase in the global oil and gas exploration efforts by that Schmill um, Vaclav Schmil, he's written like 20 books uh, related to these subjects. He's one of the best, most popular sources. And you can find uh, Vaclav Schmil, that's, you can see it there, S-M-I-L. You probably just put Schmil on your local library computer uh, portal and you'll find uh, several books. Uh, some are probably always checked out because people are using them, high school students and college students, for book report sources. <laughs> on energy subjects. 
or science fair projects, that kind of thing. Discretionary spending decreased with the energy price increases from 2007 to the summer of 2008. Oil prices hit an all-time high of $147 per barrel in the summer of 2008. Source, read 2008. This extra 5 to 10% tax from increased energy prices was added to the U.S. and economy as it had in the 1970s, and much discretionary spending disappeared, Hall et al., 2008. Speculation in real estate in the U.S. was no longer desirable or possible for as consumers tightened their belts because of higher energy costs. They had less money to spend. Um, they had to pay higher energy and uh, costs so that, you know they don't maybe have money to buy um, discretionary items like ordering a pizza delivery or going to a movie or um, they might want a winter jacket but keep the one they have instead of you know spending $150 on a new winter jacket, that kind of thing. So the whole economy slows down. Money is sucked out of everything else, you know, into the uh, fuel tanks of the trucks and uh, tractors and uh, motorcycles and everything. The stock market crashed in September 2008, reducing market value by $1.2 trillion and forcing the Dow to suffer its biggest single-day point loss ever, twin 2008. And most Western economies have essentially stopped growing since. In general, there has been a decade-by-decade decade decline in growth of the U.S. economy since 1935, in step with the decline in the annual rate of all oil production liquids generally, Hall et al., 2012. Even though the global EROI for producing oil and gas continues to be reasonably high, it is probable that EROI of oil and gas will continue to decline over the coming decades. Ganon et al., 2009. The continued pattern of declining EROI diminishes the importance of arguments and reports that the world was substantially more oil remaining to be explored, drilled, and pumped. High EROI values for oil and gas production are increasingly attributable to the inclusion of high EROI natural gas, e.g. the EROI of Norwegian oil is about half that for oil and gas combined. Grendel, Grandel, et al., 2011. The recent declining trend is described by Grandel et al. as probably due to the aging of the fields, in quotes. It is likely that the varying drilling intensity has had minimal impact on the net energy gain of these fields. Grendahl et al. 2011 expects the EROI of Norwegian oil and gas production to deteriorate further as the fields become older. Meanwhile, China's use of oil has expanded enormously so that China has been importing a larger and larger proportion of its oil from the rest of the world. Recently, China has increased its oil exploitation efforts tremendously, both inside and outside of China. So, Hugh et al. suggests that China appears to be approaching its own peak in oil production. Since 2008, producers have shifted increasingly to non-conventional oil and gas resources. Uh, in parentheses, those are tar sands, shale oil, and gas, or that mean natural gas, methane or methane, which have increased production but also costs. New technologies such as horizontal drilling and hydrofracturing are currently keeping the total levels of non-conventional and conventional natural gas production in the U.S. at rates similar to those of 1973 from conventional natural gas alone. Given the numerous shifting environmental variables and social issues surrounding horizontal drilling and fracking, in quotes, it is difficult to predict the future of non-conventional oil and gas. Hall and Klitgard, 2012. Already, some areas of production from the Barnett and Haynesville formations appear to have reached a production plateau, Hughes, 2013. 
Recent analyses by Hughes 2013 argue against assuming production will continue to increase. Much of the discussion about peak oil, Potzek and Croft 2010, involves changing mining technology and capacity rather than the quantity and quality of coal that remains available for extraction. Peak coal will likely have the greatest impact on the world's largest coal user, China. Nations with abundant untapped coal resources, i.e. the United States, Australia, and Russia, are likely to be less affected. The total recoverable coal estimated for the United States alone is approximately 500 billion tons. U.S. coal production in 2009 was about 1 billion tons. Although it is difficult to predict future production technology, environmental issues, consumption patterns, and changes in EROI, it appears that coal may be abundantly available through the next century. That means that they're looking out 100, you know, in 50 years or so. You also have to look as other energy sources drop out and the glo global population continues to grow and there's a coal-fired power plant uh, built every week in the world, uh, you know, if you take the compounding effect of using the coal, um, it may end up being much shorter as it fills the uh, needs um, left by other depleted energy sources and growing population as people want electricity and air conditioning in Africa and the tropics. Alternative renewable energies lack many of the undesirable characteristics of fossil fuels, including direct production of carbon dioxide and other pollutants. And that's in quotes, and that's a big one. Pollutants are affecting half or more of the world population right now with negative health effects. We see a, a huge rise in cancer, autism, and all types of illnesses, but also lack many of the highly desirable traits of non-renewable fossil fuels, specifically renewable energy sources, are not sufficiently energy dense, tend to be intermittent, like wind does, only blows 20% of the time, and the sun only shines during the day, and when it's not at the right angle, uh, to your solar panels, you don't get, you know, there's only a few hours of the day where you have potential solar panel uh, irradiance from the sun hitting your panels at the right angle to generate electricity. L lack transportability. Um, that's a big problem if they were to build uh, giant solar panel fields um, for solar voltaics, they'd have to worry about if they did them in the south of the United States, they'd have sandstorms and hailstorms and all the pollution from global warming and uh, the methane from our huge herds of cows and everything um, are going to make the energy systems much more um, energetic. So a tornado might hit in the desert where there's usually not tornadoes and just rip apart you know, a multi-billion dollar solar voltaic facility and then you need to build the infrastructure to transport that electricity and uh, that's very expensive and required huge amounts of metal and raw materials and cement and everything to build the uh, infrastructure. Um, most have relatively low ERI values. In northern latitudes uh, solar voltaics are an energy sink. You, you probably never get the energy out that was um, put into building and installing and maintaining them. And that's just a simple calculation. <laughs> Especially when corrections are made for intermittency. So when there is no sun or wind, you also have to build uh, another source of energy. You know, because hospitals, they got you can't stop operating, so that means they need battery packs or um, that's more infrastructure and a lot more materials and labor of tens of thousands of people building the um, battery or storage or you need a backup or you need a coal plant for when the wind and sun don't work. Currently lack of infrastructure that is required to meet current societal demands. So we're not main we the civil engineers and I think that they're being honest because I this is something I know about 
I've been a practitioner and built large construction projects and small and uh, around the uh, around the United States and the infrastructure of the United States is not being maintained it's degrading and uh, rotting uh, and falling apart faster than we're maintaining it and then you want to go and build a whole new infrastructure for this new type of energy um, there's just not enough uh, concrete and, and there's not enough labor um, Americans do not want to be outside in the heat and the cold. They like to be in a cubicle or in an office with heating and you know heat in the sun in the winter and air conditioning in the hot summers, and not out there working in a New Mexico desert uh, installing solar panels when it's a you know a hundred and blazing sun, um, or uh, work on power lines uh, on a cherry picker 30, 40 feet above the ground uh, repairing. Uh, from an ice storm uh, if because they work so you have to pay those people a lot of money and there's only a so many amount of men mo it's not 90 percent men that are willing to do that hard dangerous and you can be shocked to death and cut by sheet metal and all and get your hands busted with wrenches and uh, you know when you lose your grip on the wrench and bang it into some hard metal and hurt your knuckles make them bleed so it's hard uh, sometimes dirty work where you get um, toxic materials on you. And uh, some people, you know, even if you pay them a big wage, like $40, $50 an hour, um, you know, over $100,000 a year, they wouldn't do it. They'd rather have a much lower paying job that's inside and where they're not getting their hands cut and smashed and uh, their arms cut open and things like that, um, doing these dangerous or fall, seeing, seeing friends fall, you know, from ladders or from cherry pickers and things trying to do work. Um, if we were able to replace traditional non-renewable energy with renewables, which seems desirable to us in the long run, it would require the use of intensive uh, energy technology for their construction and maintenance. Thus, it would appear that a shift from non-renewable to renewable sources would result in declines in both quality and ERI values of the principal energies used for economic activity. So that you, you, you try to have your pie and eat it too by maintaining the current infrastructure while you transition to their new, what they call renewable, which are highly dependent on fossil fuels. You're just converting fossil fuel. You're probably just better off having a coal plant than you are you know, building a, a wind farm or something. <laughs> Although wind apparently relatively favorable from an EROI perspective and photovoltaic energy are currently the world's fastest growing renewable energies, they continue to account for less than 1% of the global energy portfolio. That, you know, what's that, five years ago when this paper was probably drafted? So 1%? All that hype and stuff you hear? For, and letters you get from your power company about windmills and solar, and uh, it's still 1%, and uh, renewables are growing slower than the use of fossil fuels is growing. That's, you see, so they're even becoming a smaller proportion. Proponents of ER, they're not even keeping up with the growth in fossil fuels, even though there's a lot of talk about it. Proponents of energy return on energy investment assessments using actual, this is critical, actual operational installations. Talk is cheap, <laughs> but it's actually doing it. And as an engineer, an actual engineer who's built things, um, whether it's skateboards or a, a cathedral, uh, building a cathedral and talking about a cathedral and standing around blueprints or building little, you know, 150th scale models or whatever isn't the same as building an actual cathedral <laughs> or an actual government building. Um, things, it's like they say in Special Forces, your plans uh, need to be changed with first contact with the enemy. And it's that same thing when you do a big construction project. There's always going to be uh, details that ground is shifting and um, there's workarounds that always have to be done to get the project done on time and uh, safe specifications so it doesn't collapse years down the road and hurt somebody 
or someone gets shocked or you know electrocuted or whatever rather than laboratory estimates believe that in order to portray renewable energy technology accurately it is necessary to make note of the fact that these technologies are dependent upon constructed and maintained using and therefore subsidized by high EROI fossil fuels. So you can't have wind without the semi-tractor trailer trucks to take the giant blades and you have to stop traffic on the interstate while the big blades are making turns and going on and off ramps and that kind of thing um, causing inconvenience to everyone to try to get one of these giant blades uh, out to the construction site and it takes a lot of people standing around watching the uh, cranes and things and with their uh, truck drivers getting paid to stand around while things are getting you know moved around higher EROI values found in conceptual studies often result from assumptions of more favorable conditions within simulations. Computer simulations in real life, um, you know, they, they, they are useful computer simulations, um, but in real life there's still trial and error and tinkering and um, making adjustments, tailoring things, and sometimes their assumptions were wrong in the computer model, and we know from the great Henri Poincaré and the Founder of the you know he's the Poincaré Institute in Paris is named after him. The you know the three body problem when you're playing billiards, or in some countries it's called pool, and a slight um, variation in your shot or the table um, when you're trying to do a com more complex combination shot um, can make a big difference. So. You know, even a small error in your assumptions can make your results vary a lot. And the people want to get projects going, and they're all incentivized to uh, exaggerate toward the positive and to be optimistic uh, when you're trying to build, let's say, a large ship like a Navy cruiser, missile cruiser, or a nuclear submarine, or a big office building, uh, you know, that's 30 stories with underground basements of seven, eight stories, and helipads on top and swimming pool and all that kind of stuff inside uh, or on top or on a balcony swimming pool near the top floors that kind of thing it all takes a lot more uh, to actually implement you know than it does to draw it up on a computer uh, that's why I always preferred being the uh, superintendent building big projects um, than sitting behind a computer um, I, I like trying to solve those real life problems for example, English wind turbines were found to operate considerably fewer hours per month than anticipated. Jefferson and Kobazewski et al. 2010 infer that variations in EROI values in the case of reported EROI values for wind energy between process and input-output analysis stems from a greater degree of subjective system boundary decision-making by the process analyst, resulting in the exclusion of certain direct, indirect costs. Other researchers believe that the focus of EROI assessments <coughs> must be on net energy produced from existing installations and variables associated with wind and photovoltaic modules once they have entered the infrastructure, rather than extrapolating into the future. Examination of concrete input and output data from operational facilities, e.g. wind turbines, Kubas Wesky 2010, appears to offer the best opportunity to calculate wind and photovoltaic EROI values accurately. Also, of, of concern is that wind and photovoltaics technology are not base load technologies. The meaning of this is very crucial meaning that future large-scale deployment beyond 20% of the grid capacity will likely require the construction of energy-intensive storage infrastructures, with, if included within EROI assessments, would likely reduce EROI values considerably. In the case of wind, the cost of inclusion within a wind EROI analysis requires not only the initial capital cost per unit output, but also the backup systems required 
for the other 70 or so percent of the time when insufficient wind is blowing. And I think that's probably too high, 30 percent, and I've heard closer to 20 percent for the wind uh, productive time. Thus, the input for an EROI analysis of wind and PV photovoltaic technologies is, by and large, upfront capital costs. This is in sharp contrast to the less well-known return over the lifespan of the system, therefore a variable referred to as energy payback time is often employed when calculating the EROI values of wind and other renewable energy sources. This is the time required for the renewable energy system to generate the same amount of energy that went into the creation, maintenance, and the disposal of the system. Um, because the solar panels will only last so many years, and every year they produce less electricity, and eventually you're going to have to take them down and uh, recycle what you can or move them and put new panels in. Uh, if the materials are available, then... 15, 20 years to replace them. But so they immediately begin to degrade. And, and uh, of course, the giant windmills have wearable parts, and the transmissions are, are um, under a huge amount of torsion strain from the wind shifting and moving at different angles, uh, trying to mash the gears together, up or down, left and right. So um, they have definitely have wearable parts and need lots of maintenance, and uh, eventually. Um, We'll get to the point where they just need to be taken down and a new windmill put in its place, the, or at least the main components, uh, the bound, like the transmission, the boundaries, which is a big project to get a transmission up that high and work up that high in a small space. The boundaries utilized to define the energy payback time are incorporated into most renewable EROI calculations. Other factors influencing wind and photovoltaic ERA values include energy storage, grid connection, dynamics, and variations in construction and maintenance costs associated with the installation program. So if you're going to go to these deserts that we're not growing food in now, maybe a little cattle grazing, and put wind and solar in our southern latitudes, uh, you're going to find a huge cost in building the infrastructure to transmit all that electricity somewhere. So the, the electricity, people don't like live in those deserts, so it's going to have to go a long way, and that infrastructure is, you know, be billions of dollars and take years to build, and there isn't even the labor to do it. All the labor that we have, uh, we have shortages in construction for skilled labor and or just reliable, good laborers that are willing to work hard. For example, offshore turbines, while located in wet, salty areas with more reliable energy-generating winds, require replacement more often. All that salt water uh, gets, you know, blown into the uh, nacelles of the uh, wind turbines and causes corrosion. It's called um, rusting, and and uh, where uh, electrons are given away. Uh, and that uh, is called corrosion. Um, the opposite is redux. Uh, turbines located in remote mountainous areas require long, distant grid connections that result in energy loss and reduce usable energy values, and they require maintenance too. Um, a tornado might come through and knock down your uh, power lines. Or they might rust if they, and then there's seawater and corrosion. You know they they need more replacement uh, faster if you're near the ocean. Because I've been a sailor in the navy and I know about corrosion in the wa salt water. <laughs> Policy implications. In conclusion, the EROI energy return on investment for most of the world's important fuels, oil and natural gas, has declined over the past one to two decades for all nations examined. Ooh, that's in conclusion. That's usually the best part. Sometimes I just read conclusions and abstracts on papers. Um, but this is so important, I wanted to go into detail. Policy implications. I'm going to read this again. In conclusion, the energy return on investment for the world's most important fuels, oil and natural gas, has declined over the past one 
or two decades for all nations combined. So th that means if you take an aggregate, all the world's energy producers of any kind of fossil fuel uh, has declined over the past two decades. It remains pot that's huge because energy, fossil fuels, is our food for our machines. And the, the machines is what provides us with air conditioning and x-ray machines when we go to the dentist and such. It remains in schools to have lighting and so they can have air conditioning in the southern latitudes of the United States uh, when it would be too hot for the kids to concentrate. They'd be sweating there in the classrooms or sitting outside under a tree instead. <laughs> it remains possible that the relatively high EROI values of natural gas extracting during and often used for the production of oil may mask a much steeper decline in EROI of oil alone. Declining EROI is probably already having a large impact on the world economy. Murphy and Hall, 2010, Teverberg, 2012. As oil and gas provide roughly 60 to 65 percent of the world's energy, this will likely have enormous economic consequences for many national economies. Coal, although abundant, is very unevenly distributed, has large environmental impacts, and has an EROI that depends greatly on the region mined. A general decline in the energy content of U.S. coal resource over time may be compensated by a shift from energy-intensive underground mining of relatively high quality but declining eastern United States coal resources to lower cost surface mining of lower energy content western United States coal, resulting in no clear trend in ERI for, for coal. The decline in EROI among major fossil fuels suggest that in the race between technological advances and depletion, depletion is winning. I'll say it again. I know this is a long video, but this is a matter of life and death for humanity and lots of uh, nature. The decline in EROI among major fossil fuels suggest that in the race between technological advances and depletion, Depletion is winning, depletion is winning, depletion is winning. Past attempts to rectify falling oil production, i.e. the rapid increase of drilling after the peak of 1970 in oil production and subsequent oil crises in the United States only exacerbated the problem by lowering the net energy delivered from United States oil production, Hall in Cleveland, 1981. Increasing prices thought by most economists to negate depletion through increasing incentives for exploitation cannot work as EROI approaches even or one to one. Your numerator and denominator are the same. And even now has made oil too expensive to support the high economic growth it once did. It would be tempting from the net energy perspective, to recommend that we replace fossil fuels with renewable energy technologies as the EROI for fossil fuels falls to a level where these technologies become competitive. While EROI analyses generate numerical assessments using quantitative data that include many production factors, they do not include other important data such as climate change, air quality, health benefits, and other environmental qualities that are considered externalities to these analyses. The energy-intensive carbon capture and sequestration, the acronym CCS, required to reduce fossil fuel emissions to levels equivalent with that of wind or solar photovoltaic electricity production would reduce the final coal EROI value considerably. E.g., Akai et al. 1997 and Dale 2010 and Lund and Biswas 2008. EROI figures do not take into account the high life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from thermal electricity production and coal-fired systems in particular. Ruji et al. 2012. 
This could, with difficulty, be worked into future more comprehensive EROI calculations. Most alternative renewable energy sources appear at this time to have considerably lower EROI values than any of the non-renewable fossil fuels. Wind and photovoltaic energy are touted as having substantial environmental benefits. These benefits, however, may have lower returns and larger initial carbon footprints than originally suggested, e.g. the externalities associated with mining of neodymium and its subsequent use in wind turbine construction. The energy costs pertaining to intermittency and factors such as the oil, natural gas, and coal employed in the creation, transport, and implementation of wind turbines and photovoltaic panels may not be adequately represented in some cost-benefit analyses. On the positive side, the fact that wind and PV produce high-quality electricity needs to be considered as well. Thus, society seems to be caught in a dilemma, unlike anything experienced in the last few centuries. During that time, most problems, such as needs for more agricultural output, worker pay, transport, pensions, schools, and social services were solved by throwing more technology investments and energy at the problem. In many senses, this approach worked for many of these problems were resolved or at least ameliorated, although at each step populations grew so that more potential issues had to be served. In a general sense, all of this was possible only because there was an abundance of cheap, i.e. high EROI, high quality energy, mostly oil, gas, or electricity. We believe that the future is likely to be very different. For while there remains considerable energy in the ground, it is unlikely to be exploitable cheaply or eventually at all because of a decreasing energy return on energy investment. Alternatives such as photovoltaics and wind turbines are unlikely to be nearly as cheap energetically or economically as past oil and gas when backup costs are considered. In addition, there are increasing costs everywhere pertaining to potential climate changes and other pollutants. Any transition to solar energies would require massive investments in fossil fuels, despite many claims to the contrary, from oil and gas advocates on the one hand and solar advocates on the other. We see no easy solution to these issues when EROI is considered. If any resolution to these problems is possible, it is probable that it would have to come at least as much from the adjustment of society's aspirations for increased material affluence and an increase in will willingness to share as from technology. Unfortunately, recent political events do not leave us with great optimism that such changes in societal values will be forthcoming. Acknowledgements. This research has been supported by the United Kingdom Department for International Development and the Santa Barbara Family Foundation. We are very grateful to several experts who provided us with very helpful unpublished data on site fuel consumption. I'm slowly going to scroll down. See, there's Dale, Alcott, uh, Ganon, Guilford, Gupta, Grant. Uh, Grandel, Hall, 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 Hayward, Hugh, uh, and Hamilton, Kubazeski there, Lund. If you combine this uh, EROI decline with the degrading in fuel, uh, in soils, um, we're really in a big uh, pickle here, uh, the human race um, and all the animals and flora and fauna because... Um, we only have so much land. We're losing over uh, 10 million hectares of, uh, that's 100 square meter uh, plots of land uh, for arable land every year because of human population growth and soil is so degraded it's no longer usable. So we have more people, uh, less arable land, um, and that's a, um, 
a gigantically huge problem, even if we didn't, even if to solve, even if we had uh, the EROI decline uh, was not there and we had steady or increasing energy, just the uh, food growing uh, problem. And land is going to be, um, do you put um, some alternative renewable energy there or um, do you use the resources for regenerative farming and people are going to have to do more physical manual type labor to grow food and uh, to co do this giant conversion which realistically it's not going to happen and we're headed uh, for a very uh, challenging probably uh, violent uh, future as people just do not you know, going to fight over the uh, shortages and scarcity. Um, Grown-ups need to face reality, uh, especially those of us with families, to uh, accurately f um, get an idea. Uh, these are super trends that, um, like demographics, uh, are very good uh, long-term indicators and forecasting tools, as is uh, the trends in energy and in uh, soils and agriculture. Thank you very much. I, if anyone did <laughs> listen to this video, I hope you got a lot out of it. Bye-bye.